Once a small fishing village, Brighton is an English seaside resort, well known for holidays, relaxation and fun. In Georgian times, Brighton became highly fashionable, gained popularity as a health resort for sea bathing and fresh air, and became easily accessible to day trippers from London. But it seems Brighton has many ghosts and hauntings linked to the old town's past. From dark entities to roaming ghosts, from poltergeist activity to restless souls. Brighton's haunted history stretches back many centuries. The lanes are a wonderful maze of narrow alleyways, famous for their tightly packed shops, antique stores and beautiful pubs. Many feel this area, dating back to the 18th century, is the heart of Brighton. One of the many phantoms witnessed roaming in this area is that of a monk who seems to haunt the lanes, gliding through the cellars, along the alleyways, above ground, and even into the town hall itself. Several times in December 1951, he appeared at a stationer's shop, John Beale & Son, located at 55 and 56 East Street at that time. The shop is currently occupied by clothing retailer French Connection. During a late evening stock take of diaries for the impending new year, a sales assistant named Miss Fema was working in the first floor stockroom alongside the manageress, Miss Goodbody. Goodbody descended into the shop to retrieve a list and Miss Fema continued with her tasks. She was surprised to hear rapid and heavy footsteps ascending the stairs at a far quicker pace than Miss Goodbody would have utilised. She called out, Is that you, Goody? thinking her colleague must be returning, as they were alone in the shop. No reply was given. She felt that she was not alone. She turned around to see the figure of a monk, wearing dark robes, standing in the stockroom with her. Somewhat shocked, she fled the stockroom, but in that momentary glance, she noticed the apparition did not have a head or visible face, just darkness enclosed in a hood. On the shop floor, she explained to Miss Goodbody her alarming encounter, and both women left the shop, refusing to work late at the shop for a considerable time. A Grade 2 listed building, Brighton Town Hall, stands on Bartholomew Square, just off the lanes. Built in the Greek Revival style, it opened in 1832 and is reputedly Brighton's most haunted building. The building was constructed on a site that was previously the location of the Priory of St Bartholomew and then the Brighton Market, built in 1774. During the excavations to create the foundations of the previously existing market hall, workmen discovered an ancient cemetery and several complete skeletons were uncovered. A phantom monk of the lanes is said to appear inside the town hall and its vicinity. The building was used for several purposes, including as a law court, concert venue, administrative building and morgue. 
The police force at Brighton, formed in 1838, established a police station in the building, including police cells in its basement, which remained in use until the 1960s. The cells are said to be rife with paranormal activity. The dark shadow of a man has been seen moving through the cell walls, accompanied by loud screams and the sounds of keys rattling. Other unnerving activity includes whispering, hissing sounds and the sound of a heavy object being dragged across the floor. The atmosphere is said to be heavy, oppressive, negative and some visitors leave absolutely terrified, refusing to return. People have been physically touched, scratched, pushed and felt the presence of a person standing directly next to them, breathing heavily. For many years, the ghostly activity in the cells has been attributed to one man, Henry Solomon, a well-respected chief constable, who was murdered in the building on the 13th of March, 1844. At the time, Solomon was interviewing a local man, 23-year-old John Lawrence, who had been arrested for stealing a roll of carpet. During the interview, Lawrence was agitated and requested to be moved into a basement room where conditions would be warmer. This was granted and the interview continued. At one point, Solomon was about to leave the room. He turned his back and Lawrence seized an iron poker from the fireplace and bludgeoned Solomon to death, striking him across the head. Lawrence was found guilty of murder and was hanged on top of the county jail at Horsham. Solomon left a wife and nine children. Does the ghost of Solomon return to haunt the police cells? He was buried at Florence Place, Old Jewish Burial Ground, in the Round Hill District. Could the unpleasant apparition be that of his murderer, John Lawrence, whose body was buried at Horsham Jail at 10 o'clock at night with only the governor and the burial assistants present? Before his execution, Lawrence admitted that he had no malice towards the deceased. He stated that at the moment of the murder, a sudden and uncontrollable impulse impelled him to seize the poker. He has, all along, declared that he could not tell what possessed him at that moment, but the thought to kill the deceased suddenly came across his mind and he could not resist it. Do we believe his testimony, or could a dark entity in the cells have possessed Lawrence in that fatal moment? Solomon wasn't the only person to pass away in the cells at the town hall. In November 1880, a lady named Harriet Ball, aged 32, was found lying on the pavement between Middle Street and West Street shortly before midnight. She was bleeding from the nose and became somewhat abusive as PC Terry, who found her, took her to the cells. She was given refreshments and bedding by PC Winton on duty at the cells. At 5am, she was white and had stopped breathing. A doctor was called, but it was too late. At the inquest, it transpired that the deceased suffered from epilepsy, but her death was caused by organ failure. On the 18th of August, 1888, a man named John Payne, aged 65, was found dead in the cells at the town hall. He was a hawker, selling buttons, and on a Wednesday night, he was found drunk and incapable and was conveyed to the police cells. He was visited at intervals, but he passed away in the cell at 4.15am. In 1891, an unknown woman died in the cells somewhat unexpectedly. The lady, estimated to be around 45 years old, 
was found in West Street, seemingly intoxicated. She was taken to the police station, but she died as the constable visited her a second time. It was revealed that she had died from a fractured skull and subsequent brain hemorrhage, probably caused by a fall. Poltergeist activity has occurred in the cells, with the mannequins being moved, chairs and exhibits being found in different locations, and coins and objects being thrown. Could the collective energy of the spirits of the deceased be making themselves known to those who visit the cells today? The ruined structure and its tragic past is said to be the work of a dark entity that brought death, injury, destruction and demise to this once iconic landmark. Local legend tells of a malevolent unseen force that existed within the fabric of the pier itself. The West Pier was constructed during the 1860s when pleasure piers were a booming industry across the country designed to attract tourists to seaside destinations. 22 pleasure piers were built around this time. It was Brighton's second pier, the first being the Royal Suspension Chain Pier, that opened in 1823 and was destroyed in a storm in December 1896. The West Pier was extended in 1893 and a new pavilion, with the capacity for 1,400 people, was added to watch concerts, shows and provide entertainment. But the West Pier really seems to have a catalogue of tragic events. On the 25th of July, 1882, a fatal accident occurred at the end of the West Pier. A visitor from London, Charles Franklin, was on the West Pier around 8am. He was staying at the Grand Hotel, He'd been swimming and ascended the steps onto the pier. As he dried off, he saw a strong wooden box on the boards, the sort used by wine merchants to transport six bottles of wine. He admitted throwing the box into the sea, merely to see whether it would float. At that moment, an 11-year-old boy, Craven Patrick Trenchard from Adelaide Crescent, West Brighton, was swimming off the pier in a designated swimming area with a friend. The box struck the lad who immediately sank and did not return to the surface. The box was thought to weigh 25 pounds. Charles Franklin was arrested and taken to the police cells at the town hall for questioning. The body of the boy was missing for four days and was spotted lying on a sandbank beneath the water by a lady and gentleman out boating. An inquest was held at the town hall shortly after the incident, where Franklin was asked why he threw the box into the water. The answer he gave was to see how fast the current was moving. Eventually, the coroner was able to hold an inquest and stated that the skull was extensively fractured and that death would have been instantaneous. The case went to court with Charles Franklin, aged 28, accused of manslaughter. The question for the jury to consider was did this amount to criminal neglect or excusable homicide? The jury deliberated and eventually returned a verdict of guilty of criminal neglect, but recommended the prisoner receive mercy. In the end, Mr Justice Field sentenced Charles Franklin to two months imprisonment without hard labour. In his summing up, the judge declared that although the prisoner had not any criminal intention, the act was illegal in one sense and a wanton and mischievous act, though it did not amount to that degree of badness which would make itself a crime. Could the collision of the wooden box with the little boy be simply a coincidence, or could more sinister forces have been responsible for this terrible event? In August 1884, a 62-year-old surgeon named Alexander Tweedy was visiting from London. 
He died of a heart attack on the pier. He'd been chasing a man named John Wade, aged 19, who'd stolen his silver pocket watch in a run-and-grab robbery. Tweedy gave chase, but it was too much, and he collapsed and died on the boards of the West Pier. Wade was captured by the pier master and taken to Brighton Police Station. He was subsequently sentenced to 12 months hard labour. Other tragic events include the death of seven Royal Navy sailors at the pier in April 1900. HMS Desperate, a two-funnel 30-knot destroyer, was anchored off the Brighton coast. About half past four, 12 men were put in a rowing boat heading towards the West Pier when their boat became swamped by choppy water. The occupants were seen struggling in the water and spectators saw the men unable to float. Lifeboats were launched and picked up some of the men, but the bodies began to wash up on the beach. The seven men who died were buried at Brighton Cemetery with full naval honours. 30,000 people crowded the cemetery that day. In August 1909, Workmen, employed under the structure of the pier, noticed a figure in red clothing low down in the deep water. The body was recovered and taken to the mortuary at the town hall. She was identified as Agnes Archbutt, aged 45, a visitor from London who was staying at a house in Manchester Street. She had been seen on the pier the previous evening as her daughter, Gladys, was appearing in a play, Mrs Pondbury's Pass, in the pavilion. After the performance, she walked with her daughter and the cast along the pier, but she stopped for a moment and either fell or was pushed into the water. She shrieked and splashed, which attracted the attention of the others, but despite searching, she could not be found. Her body was identified by her son-in-law, Herbert. Herbert and Gladys had only married two days before. Tragedy struck the pier again in 1912 when Mr Arthur Heppel, better known by his stage name, Professor Cyril, a trick diver on the West Pier, fell to his death in front of a crowd of onlookers. He was ready to perform his signature high dive with a bicycle into the sea, a trick he'd wowed the crowds with for many years. He'd cycle down a plank around a yard wide, sloping from the top of the pier pavilion and across the pier deck where he'd become airborne and land in the sea. On this occasion, the crowd looked up to see the bicycle swerve. The diver tried to correct it and amidst cries of horror from the spectators, Professor Cyril, fell 25 feet down, head first, onto the deck. It seemed the front wheel of the bicycle had become loose and unstable. At the inquest, the coroner stated that such performances were dangerous and senseless. Death was the result of a fractured skull, and the much-loved Professor Cyril, aged just 35, became another victim of the dark entity of the West Pier. In September 1923, an unknown man vanished off the end of the West Pier. He'd been seen drinking a glass of wine and swaying as he sat on the boards. Moments later, he disappeared into the water and shouts were raised that he needed rescuing. On hearing the cries, Zoe Estelle Bridgen, who worked as a high diver at the pier, plunged into the water to rescue the man. She pulled him up and placed a buoyancy aid under his head. She was able to keep him afloat until a boat arrived, but sadly it was too late. At the inquest, witnesses were called, but nobody was sure if he deliberately entered the water or accidentally rolled off the pier. His death was declared to be due to drowning. By the 1960s, the pier was in serious financial trouble, with declining visitors and increasing maintenance costs. In the 1970s, the pier head was closed due to safety concerns and the remainder of the pier closed in 1975. 
In 1987, the pier was structurally damaged in a serious storm, and in 1991, access from the shore was removed for safety reasons. In 2002, the walkway between the concert hall and the pavilion fell into the sea during a storm, and a series of fires in March and May of 2003 sealed the fate of this historic, yet perhaps tragic structure. So many fatalities occurred on and around the West Pier, from the deaths of children, parents, sailors and entertainers. Are these just unlucky incidents, or is the pier actually haunted by a very dark entity? What do you think? The Grand Brighton Hotel stands proudly on Brighton's seafront. Built in 1864, it's a prestigious hotel and was aimed at members of the upper classes visiting the city. It has sweeping views, opulent decor, fine dining, and when it opened, it even had a hydraulically powered lift. On the 12th of October 1984, the hotel was bombed by the Provisional Irish Republican Army in an attempt to assassinate Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher during the Conservative Party conference. A bomb had been planted in room 629 and detonated just before 3am. A five-ton chimney stack crashed through the structure into the basement and the hotel's beautiful facade was left with significant damage. Thatcher survived the explosion, but five other people were killed, none of whom were cabinet ministers. Others survived, but were left permanently disabled, paralysed, and 34 were left injured. The kitchens of the hotel, in the past, were reputedly home to poltergeist activity. In the late 1800s, until around 1920, kitchen staff noticed some very odd occurrences. One member of staff witnessed old coins being dropped directly next to his feet. Thinking they had fallen from his pocket, he picked them up to see the coins were not ones in circulation at that time. This happened several times in the run-up to Christmas for two years. Nobody could explain where they had come from. Staff witnessed cupboard doors slowly open by themselves, only to slam shut with great force. A baker watched three of his knives on a surface rotate so the blades pointed at him rather than the handles. Objects appeared to be thrown, plates smashed, metal trays dropped to the floor, utensils were found elsewhere in the kitchen, and people felt taps on the shoulder and arms to find no one was around. There are two stories that might explain this activity in the hotel. The first is a legend of a maid who worked at the Grand Hotel and was jilted at the altar by a member of the kitchen staff not long after the hotel had opened. She is said to have been so devastated by his actions that she died of a broken heart within three days. Could she be responsible for such strange activity in the kitchen? A bizarre incident took place in the kitchens at the Grand on the 31st of May 1901. Two chefs named Ernest and Bernard were examining a revolver in the bakehouse of the hotel. Ernest, for fun, pointed the weapon at Bernard and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. Just after, Bernard took the revolver and pointed it at Ernest and said, I will shoot you, and pulled the trigger twice, but it did not go off. Once more, Ernest took the revolver, and as the door opened, he pointed it into the passageway and pulled the trigger. This time, the revolver discharged, as another chef, Henry, was rushing past, and he was shot in the neck. He died minutes later. An inquest was held, and it was stated that the deceased was 24 years old, and that he'd been working at the Grand for roughly a month. Henry and Ernest were great friends, and one witness declared that Ernest's grief when he saw what he had done was terrible. The bullet penetrated the base of the brain, and death was instantaneous. The jury returned a verdict of death from misadventure. 
Ernest, aged 33, was charged with causing the death of Henry. He stated to the police that the weapon went off accidentally while he was playing with it. One week later, Ernest was acquitted. Could the unsettled spirit of Henry have returned in the years following his death to haunt those responsible for his untimely demise? Could he be responsible for some of the unexplained phenomena at the Grand Hotel? I just wanted to run past you some other stories that I found um, since I made this video. And this always seems to be the case. You make a video, you do your research, you look into it, and then you find something else. So just going back to the West Pier, it really seems like it had so many catastrophic incidents. I only fished out a few of them for you. There was an incident there which happened on the 26th of November in 1944. There was a plane with a VIP in it and it was escorted by four military aircraft. And one of them clipped the West Pier and lost a wing, or certainly damaged a wing, and it ended up down on Brighton Beach and all the people on the beach had to sort of lie flat. The pilot luckily didn't fly it into the, into the town centre as it was. He died later in hospital from his injuries apparently. So that's, a, that's another strange occurrence. And that was a Hawker Typhoon aircraft. There's a story of a ghost on that pier of a girl dressed in white and people believe that she had a drug overdose in the 1980s. I couldn't find very much about this and I don't want to bring up too much in the past because her relatives could be um, alive today. But that's a very sad story, and apparently she's been seen on the beach as well, sort of roaming around, looking a bit lost. So that's quite sad. This next one it could be an urban myth. Maybe somebody from Brighton can help me with this one. I read that after the terrible fires in the early 2000s, the only thing that remained on the pier was the tarot reader's hut, and that was intact. Now, if that's true, that's quite extraordinary. I find that really, really odd. Can anybody confirm whether that is the case? Because surely that's a bit of a bit of a mystery. Do you think there's such a thing as a dark entity on that West Pier? I think it sounds like there could be. Mind you, swimming in the sea can be dangerous. But the number of incidents strikes me that there's something not quite right there. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you again.